Amen. So back in Exodus, um, by now in Exodus, you kind of understand what's going on. We've pretty much had the same theme over the past three or four weeks. You understand, I hope, what God is doing as he is leading his people through uh, the wilderness um, to towards Sinai. This is not the wilderness they're going to be in for 40 years, but this is a uh, wilderness there on the Sinai Peninsula as they're heading toward Mount Sinai, uh, where God will give them the commandments and uh, establish them as his nation. Um, and what he's doing, and we've seen it over the several weeks, is he's continually testing his people. He is continually teaching his people how they are to live as his covenant people in anticipation of the covenant that he's going to make uh, with them as he gives them the law at Sinai. You remember how he has done that over the last several weeks? Yeah, the manna, that was one. They were without food. They grumbled and he provided manna, but not just the manna. He provided them. Uh, he commands them on how they are to gather it and uses the manna to teach them about the Sabbath observance. And that's the first place in Scripture where we have a command of the Sabbath. They were without water, and they grumbled, and God provided for them uh, water at the time to, for His provision. And as we've walked through each stage after the Red Sea event, as they've been walking through uh, the wilderness um, on their way to Sinai, as we walk through each stage and God has done his work in each stage, we've also seen at every single point, God also gave them ways to remember Ways to remember his power, his, his provision for them. You remember a couple of those ways? The manna is one. Remember he said, take some of the manna and place it before the Lord as a remembrance in future, for the future. Passover. Passover was the remembrance. Consecration of the sons was a remembrance. The feasts and festivals to remember God's work. Um, what God is doing through this is he is lovingly uh, providing for them, of course, giving them water, giving them food, guiding them with a pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. He, but he's also training them to live as the covenant people that he is going to uh, make them at Sinai. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see that again tonight with two more events. We're going to get through the whole of chapter 17 tonight, hopefully. If not, we'll do the rest next time, but I think we can, we can do this in the time that we have. Um, but we're also going to see uh, that, of course, he is training them still, but the people continue to grumble still. And it gets to the point where... Moses says here in this text, as they do it again, that they are testing God. And so we're going to talk about that. So what I want to do is I want to read the first seven verses, which is the first incident. Then we'll go and we'll walk through those seven verses. And then I'll read together 8 through 16. And then we'll walk through 8, 16 together. Okay. So verse, uh, flip it for me for the first time, Jill, please. Uh, it says, And the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, look at it, according to the commandment of the Lord. He was leading them. And they camped at this place called Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirst there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They still had livestock with them. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, God's staff, and go. And... Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, 
and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They were doubting his presence. So if we go through this event, the text starts out by saying that the congregation of the people of Israel, they moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages. So it's, it's encompassing uh, not just one big move, but a bunch of little moves as they're moving through on by stages. But they're moving according to the commandment of the Lord. And they come to this place called Rephidim. But uh, you, make sure you understand that, that it's very explicit in telling us that it was according to God's commands. It was according to the commandment of the Lord that they set out. It was according to the commandment of the Lord that they stop at each stage. It's according to the commandment of the Lord that they came to this particular place called a Rephidim. How was God leading them to leave, to stop, to leave, to stop, to leave, and to finally come to this place? Remember? Yes, cloud, the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. Um, but they also, that's, that's a fact, that was, the answer, that was the correct answer. But they were also, remember, they were given manna every single day. So they would go out and they would gather the manna and they would set out. When God, so God was not only leading them with pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, but he was leading them by providing for them all the way along their journey. Daily, they were, they were going out to get this manna on the sixth day, double portion, rest on the seventh day. There should be no doubt at this point that God is with them. So God leads them to this place, Rephidim, but something's wrong here. What's wrong? There's no water. God has led them to a place with no water. And later in the chapter, we're going to see that this is also a place where Israel is attacked for the first time by another nation. So God has again led them to a place where there is danger and there is a lack, the lack of water specifically. So is this a big oops on God's part? No. No. Why did he lead them here? To test them, of course. They had failed this test before, remember? There was no water. They grumbled. They doubted. God provided. Now here they are facing the same test. God's like a good second grade teacher. If you fail it, you're going to take it over again. And so God is going to put them through this test again. And how do they respond? The exact same way they responded last time. It says the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Same thing they said before, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock out here? Now, it would seem that the people had learned nothing from the previous test with no water or the previous test with no food where God provided both miraculously for them. This is now in since they have left Egypt. This is the fourth time that they have grumbled against the Lord because of some lack that they perceive. And once again, they find fault with Moses. He is the whipping boy. He's the target of their quarreling and of their grumbling. They say to Moses, give us water to drink as if, as if, you know, miracle working Moses can just magically produce water on command. You know, the word, the word quarrel is used in this section where it hasn't been used before. Um, to demonstrate, I think, a new level of hostility. The people are, they're getting more aggressive. Uh, it's amazing to think that they reacted this way again, isn't it? I mean, they were led to this place by a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And on the very day, on this day, that they're quarreling with Moses and they're saying, why did you bring us out of here and give us a... On this day... They walked out and got the miraculous manna from the, from the ground to eat. So, 
It shows us something about Israel that we already know. They're stubborn, they're rebellious, they're all those things. But the question I often ask is, is we, we also have a unique ability to look God's blessings and His provisions in the face and then grumble about what we think we don't have. We're susceptible to that. Yes, we can look back in our own lives and we can see God has blessed me here. God came through for me here. God did a miraculous work in my life here. God has done all of these things. And then when trial hits, God, where are you? Why have you led me out here? Why have you done this? We're no different than Israel. In verse 2, Moses calls their quarreling, their grumbling, Testing God. You see it? Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? What does he mean by that? What does testing the Lord mean? Especially in this circumstance. We see what they're doing. They see what we see what they're saying. They see we see where their hearts is, are. God led them here. What is testing the Lord here? They definitely hadn't learned. How are they testing? What does it mean to test the Lord? Dustin, just shout it out. Are they giving him reason, giving God reason to no longer be merciful? Giving him reason to no longer be merciful? Yes, they well they'll continually do that for forty years. It they'll was like my kids when they were little. They would test me until I finally gave them spank Yeah. <laughs> I bet that was something. <laughs> Barbara said it was just like her kids when they were little, they would continually test her until she finally just gave them a spanking. You yeah. Also be testing his, is his presence really with them? Are you really ill? And, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's correct. You remember verse 7, the last verse we read? He said they named him these things because they said, is the Lord with us or not? You know, in... in they want, uh, based on the context, they're quarreling for water, they're quarreling with Moses, they're grumbling, and, and Moses says, what you're doing is testing God. Th their grumbling is testing God. They want God to prove himself again. We, we test God when we demand an explanation when things don't, you know, when our expectations aren't met. We test God when we demand proof of God's nature and of God's faithfulness. You know, God's word is faithful. He is faithful to his word. And there can be no doubt about that. And there is no, uh, uh, there is no changing in that. He is immutable and he is faithful to his word. But there are many times where we say, God, if you loved me, you know, you wouldn't do this. Why, why are you doing this? Why, why are you letting this happen? Why, why have you brought me to this place? Why are you allowing these circumstances? We're, we're testing God when we say, God, you know, show me that you're here. Show me that your promise is true. Show me that it is a demand of proof. God, prove that you're faithful to me. Prove that your nature is good and loving to me through Jesus Christ. It's as if we're out, we ourselves are sitting in judgment of God's ways instead of trusting God's ways, knowing that I don't understand, but I know that God is good and that He is love and that He does keep His word. So I don't know how it's going to work out and I don't know why this is going on, but I do trust you. It's the opposite of that. It's testing God. And it's one of the things Jesus said when He was tempted in, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, saying, quoting verse from Deuteronomy, thou shalt not test the Lord God. This is the opposite of faith. It's rebellion. And God himself speaks about this incident in Psalm 95. Let me read Psalm 95, 7 through 9. This is that latter part of 7. It says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as at Meribah. That's the place name we just read. As on the day at Massa. That's the other place name right here. In the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Do you see what he's saying? saying that they saw the pillar of cloud, they saw when I gave them water, they saw when I gave them quail, they saw when I gave them manna, and still, when hard circumstances came, they wanted to test me again. They wanted me to prove it again, that I truly am God, that I truly do love them, that I truly am going to take care of them. They were testing Him. So, if you were God, 
and you have led Israel out of Egypt and all of these circumstances have happened as we've walked through them, what would you do at this point? Smack them upside the head, huh? Send a flood. Yes, send a flood. <laughs> he said he wasn't going to do that again. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you would rain down judgment, wouldn't you? I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, uh, this is the fourth time just in the matter of since I miraculously led you out of Egypt with miracles and plagues. It's the fourth time you've grumbled about not having something that I told you I'm going to provide for you and bring you safely into the land. You know, you would send lightning bolts and fire and you would send judgment. But God demonstrates the gospel to them and provides water for them. Let me show you what I mean by that. In verse 4... We read this, this kind of a, a long passage, but it, it says, Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with his people? They're almost ready to stone me. You can see the heightened aggressiveness of the people now. They, Moses thinks they're going to kill him. And the Lord said to Moses, and this is, this is the command. It's not smite them with judgment or rain down fire upon them. He says, pass before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, that's important, and go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. Horeb is close to Sinai. And you shall strike the rock. And the water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Let's break that down and see what's going on. So Moses pretty much embodies how we would feel in this situation. You can see his frustration. What am I going to do with these people? What am I supposed to do with these people? They are never going to... It's as if he's saying they're, they're never going to learn. They're never going to trust you. They're never going to, they're, they're, they're never going to realize that you are God and you are going to take care of, uh, of them because you have led them out of Egypt. And uh, it sounds like Moses almost is... is he speak, I don't know if he believes this, but he's speaking like it's a lost cause. What am I going to do with these people? And he sounds greatly fearful, genuinely fearful. The, the people's hostilities reached a new level. He actually thinks they're going to stone him. He sounds panicked, and he sounds like he's just asking, God, you've got to do something. What am I going to do? I, I can't do this. Moses brings all of this to God, and God says to him, instead of, I'm going to judge them, I'm just going to give them water, God tells them to do something that's pretty elaborate. God tells him to get the elders together and to walk out in front of the people to go before them, to pass before them. Uh, in ancient times, the elders were convened to adjudicate matters. So God, it's as if God is convening a court. He's gathering a jury. There, there he is to do, Moses is to do this in front of them so that they can see it. They're going to judge as God shows them how he will respond to their test. There, which is sinful distrust of him. Moses is to take the staff of God, which was used to strike the Nile. I think he says this because we're talking about not having water, and this was a judgment. You remember when God uh, used Moses and the staff? He struck the Nile in judgment and it turned to blood. Uh, that, that staff was used as a rod of his judgment in Egypt. And he's to make sure that they're all watching. And look at verse 6. He says, Behold... I will stand before you there on the rock. I will stand on the rock and you will strike the rock with the rod of judgment. You see what he's saying? Moses is to strike the rock with the staff of God's judgment that was used on the Nile. That's why he mentions the Nile. The people deserve to be struck with judgment, but instead, God will take the judgment upon himself. I'm going to stand on the rock, and you strike it with the rod, and then water will come forth. God himself is submitting himself to his judgment. And you really understand what this picture shows when you see how Paul interprets it in 1 Corinthians 10. He says this, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the, the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud, and into the sea. He's talking about the coming out of Egypt. And all ate the same spiritual food, which was the manna. 
and all drank from the, sp sa the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. It's a picture of the gospel. God himself standing, Christ, the rock. God standing upon the rock, the rock being struck in the judgment that the people deserve. And because it's struck, living water flows out for the people to drink. God himself is submitting himself to judgment. What a picture of the gospel. The people deserve judgment for their sin. There is no doubt, and their sin is escalating. It, we're not talking about just grumbling. They are grumbling, but we're not talking about just that. They're quarreling with Moses. They're testing God over and over again. And God submits himself for judgment so that his people could live. God stands on the rock, and he himself is struck. They wanted to know if God is with them or not. Do you remember we read that in verse 7? It says, he named them these things because they tested the Lord by saying, is how they tested him, is the Lord among us or not? They wanted to know if he was with them or not. Well, there he is. He's standing on the rock, taking the judgment that you deserve, providing the water that you need to live. Make sure you don't, also, just side note, make sure you don't confuse this incident with one that happens just like it later in the book of Numbers where Moses uh, sins by striking the rock twice and is judged for it and not allowed to go into the promised land. Here, God is training His people to trust Him. But He's also showing them that He Himself is their provider, even taking the judgment they deserve to save their lives. This event, is, this event is something that the people of Israel need to remember. So he names the place that they would, so that they would remember his faithfulness and they would remember their, their unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. He names the place Massah and Meribah. Massah means testing and Meribah means quarreling. So he names it Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord. Now by naming the place these names, they would always remember their sin and what God did for them in this place. They will remember that they doubted God's presence among them. How many places on the map of our lives ought to be named testing and quarreling? because of how we complain about God's work or God's presence or doubting God's provision, doubting God's presence with us. But praise God, He's done the same for us. He's taken our judgment upon Himself so that we might have living water. You see the test? How God brought them here to test them again because they failed the test before. And in turn... His people sinfully and rebelliously tested God. And instead of blasting them with judgment and condemnation, God Himself, in His mercy and grace, took that judgment upon Himself. Took the striking with the rod of judgment upon Himself so that His people could have water. And then, just like He's done with the manna and the feasts and festivals and all of the things, He names the place. He has Moses name these places so that they will remember. He's teaching them. He's teaching them his goodness, his faithfulness, his provision, and he's teaching them how to live as his covenant people. Questions? Sweet. But the test for Israel isn't over yet. Now something happens, something else happens in this same place where God has brought them. Let's read 8 through 16, get the whole thing together. It says, Then Amalek came, and some of your translations might say the Amalekites, came and fought with Israel at Rephidim, the same place. God led them here, there's no water, and they get attacked here. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses and 
Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. When, and while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Whole lot going on in there, isn't it? All right, so remember, God led them to this place. He knew they would be without water. He knew that the Am Amalekites would attack. All of this is in the purposes of the Lord. This is actually the first battle that Israel will engage in on their journey to the Promised Land, but it will not be the last. So we also see just by way of application before we dive into the text is that our life of faith is not just tested in our lack or our circumstances or our hard times. It's also tested by the enemy's attacks. God is using the Amalekites to teach his people something. So back to verse 8, it said, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Anybody know who Amalek is? How do you know that? Because you got a study note in your Bible? Yeah, that's correct. He's Esau's grandson. So this is, you know, the animosity between Esau and the Israelites. Uh, this, is, this is the beginning of a long history of animosity between these, these two peoples. Now, I want to make sure you see something else before we continue in the text. The attack wasn't Amalek and his army or the Amalekites lining up in front of Israel, blocking their path and being ready to attack them, saying, come out to battle and fight us. The, the Amalekites, they attacked the helpless and the vulnerable among the people at the back of the line in secret coordinated attacks. Moses would later say in Deuteronomy 25, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, meaning the people at the back, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God. So they were mercilessly killing and attacking the rear of Israel as they were marching through, probably women and children and all of the people that would be at the back of the, uh, of the line that were moving forward. So now after all that we've seen, God do to provide for his people, to protect his people, to destroy the Egyptian army, to send plague after plague upon the Egyptians. I really would expect God just to say, hey, the Amalekites are in the way. Now they're not. You know, God would just miracle them to death or, or lightning bolt them or send a plague or, or, or do something. You would expect God just to destroy them by a miracle. But that's not what he does here. That's not what will train the people to learn how to fight while they trust in the Lord. They're going to have plenty of fights ahead. Even after they come into the promised land, they're going to spend a long time warring with the people there. Look what Moses says in verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, have we seen Joshua before yet in Exodus? Ah, uh, trick question. This is the first mention of Joshua in the Bible. Up to this point, don't hear a peep. And that's strange to us because like we're telling a story here. You're supposed to introduce the characters. Moses is writing to Israel. They know who Joshua is, so he doesn't waste time introducing him. They, they know who he is. He took over for Moses after Moses died, and they know who he is. So he's just introduced as if everybody already knows him. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Look what Moses says. 
I will stand on top of the hill. I will have the staff of God in my hand. Okay, you got it? Remember that. Joshua is to choose some men and go out and meet them in battle. The battle, as we've already read, the battle will be the Lord's for sure. He will win the battle for them. But Israel themselves must fight. They must go out to fight. And Moses is going to go up to the hill with the staff of God in his hand. And look what happens. In verse 10 it says, So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. You see what's going on here? The text doesn't focus on the battlefield. It doesn't focus on the tactics of Joshua or the strategy of Joshua or the fighting prowess of Israel or even how the battle plays out. The focus is not on the battlefield. It's up on the hill. When the staff is raised, it just says hands, but most people think he's raising the staff. When the staff is raised, they win. And when it's lowered, they begin to lose. What's Moses doing when he's raising the staff of God in the air? Why, is, why, do, why, are, they, why do, are they winning when the staff is raised and losing when the staff is lowered? Praising. Huh? Praising. Praising. That's one view for sure. There's another view that said he was praying, that he was interceding. Um, Israelites often prayed with their hands up in the air. We're not told that he said anything, but that view is possible. It's possible he was praying. He was interceding for the people. Uh, we're not really sure what he was doing, but the point is clear, isn't it? The staff raised is an unmistakable sign of their dependence upon God. They're victorious because God is fighting for them. When the staff of the Lord is raised in the air, they win. When the staff of the Lord is lowered, they start losing. So you see, they, they must fight the battle. They must fight the battle. There is, no, there is no easy path that they're going to be on on the way to the promised land. They must fight as the enemies attack, but they must do so depending upon the Lord in faith because the battle belongs to the Lord. You see that? Questions, comments? There's also another lesson that the people of Israel must learn and we must learn. Dependence upon the Lord for God's people can't be done in isolation. You hear Moses? I'm going to go up on the hill and I'm going to hold the staff of God in my hand. Well, it says, but Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone, they put him under, put it under him, and he sat on it. And while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. See what happens here? They need each other. Moses is not a weak man. He's going to die. In fact, when he dies, it's going to say he, he still retained his strength and even in his old age. He's not a weak man by any stretch of the imagination. But you know as well as I do, just in practical everyday living, holding your arms up all day is an impossible task. You, you try it. You know, you try it. You can't do it. You can't. So while Moses stands on the mountain... Holding the staff of God, that's a beautiful picture of dependence on God. And it's a beautiful picture of, of uh, faith in God to win the battle. He can't do it alone. So these two men come alongside to help and they lift his arms when he's weary. We don't know how they did it. I'm inclined to think, you know, he's sitting on the stone and they're probably got their hands like this under his elbows, you know, or holding it. We don't know how. That's just me thinking. I don't know. But we need to understand that the battle is won by the Lord. It's not even won because Moses is strong enough to depend on the Lord. He's helped. And... The people together believed in the power of the Lord and they helped one another, they helped Moses specifically, hold the staff up in faith. 
We have to help one another trust in God. Helping one another trust in His provision and His victory. Now, make sure you understand, the Israelites are fighting the battle, but they're fighting in the power of the Lord, and they're doing so together in faith. And when it's all over, when all of this is done, and the battle is won because together they depended upon the Lord as they fought this battle. Once again, after every test we've seen it, God calls His people to remember what happened here. Last verses we'll read today, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this, see it, as a memorial. Once again, remember the Passover, remember the feasts, remember the manna, remember, he's telling them to remember after every one of these tests, and now he does it again. Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. Why do you think he says recite it in the ears of Joshua? Because Joshua is going to be the next leader. That's exactly right. That I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Moses is to write down, recite it to Joshua, who would be Moses' successor, to write down what's happened here and God's judgment that he has deemed upon Amalek for their attack upon Israel. Now, it won't be until the days of David that the Amalekites are finally wiped out for good. They're going to be defeated several times, and, and Saul tries to take them out, and they're going to still be around, and David is finally going to wipe them out for good. But God deemed judgment upon them for their attack upon God's people. They are to remember what happened here. Why does God want them to remember that God has deemed judgment upon the Amalekites? Why would it be important? Because he's their people. And they're his people. They're his people? Jesus hasn't come. But when, you're right, you're right. But if, what I, I'm not phrasing the question very well. Why does God want Israel, his people, to always remember that God has judged and is judging and will be at war with Amalek for generation to generation. It's to remind them, as we saw in that Deuteronomy passage, of what God did for them in this place. They attacked, God defeated them in His power as they fought, and now God has judged them. So, the provision God provides here is not just a one-time, hey, you know, they came, they attacked, but hey, we defeated them, and yeah, praise God. No, no. What God says is, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, the Lord, Moses says, the Lord is going to be at war with them from generation. When you, when you understand, he's saying, not only am I going to provide victory for you, but I'm going to completely wipe out your enemies. And I'm going to be at war with them from generation to generation for what they have done here as they have come against the people of God. You see that? Questions, comments? And then like all of Israel's fathers that we walk through in Genesis who wandered in the land, Moses builds an altar to the Lord. Why did they build altars? Remember? Huh? Remembrance. There's a few other things as well. Remembrance. Worship. Thanksgiving for what God has done in this place. And they name it Yahweh Nisi. You probably, you probably heard it, Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. What does that mean? What do you think it means? Don't be afraid to give a wrong answer. There's, no, there's several things it could mean. When they went to war, they carried banners to bid for whose army they were. Yeah, yeah. The, go ahead. He's going before, too. The banner goes you know, one before, behind the whole Absolutely. The banner over me is love. Have yeah, the banner over me is love. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think all of those are right. So 
Indeed, armies did carry banners to signify, and the Lord is our banner. The Lord is the one who, the, we are his army. And that banner is protection as well. The banner over me is, is I don't know that song, but whatever, whatever y'all said. No, I don't know that song. And we have a hint in the next words Moses says, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. Now, that is a notoriously hard Hebrew phrase to translate. You got an NIV. What does your NIV say? Anybody? They have their fists against the Lord's throne. Yeah. So the NIV takes it as, it's saying, ESV says, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The NIV says, they have raised a hand against the Lord. And that's why the Lord's our banner. Hey, anybody got, you got a Holman Christian Standard? What does it say? It says, my hand is lifted up toward the throne of the Lord. And I, the NSV just goes in a whole different direction because, uh, because the word throne is close to the word sworn. And it says, the Lord has sworn, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So there are several different interpretations depending on the translation. What I think fits the context best, and this is just an opinion, we can disagree and it, it doesn't matter. What I think fits the context best is that the Lord is sovereign sitting upon His throne and one of two things is being said here. Either I have put my hand to the throne of God as Moses raised the staff because God is my banner, or the Amalekites have put their hand against the throne of God, and that's why he's going to war with them over generation to generation. ESV would translate it, uh, seemingly the interpretation would be, Moses' hand is lifted up to the throne of the Lord in faith, and that's why uh, the Lord's given them victory, and the Lord will have war against Amalek. Questions? Does it alter the meaning that much? Not really. Not really. Evan, you want to ask something bad? Go ahead. I kind of do, but it, you may have answered it and I might have not understood it. But it goes back to the Israelites testing God. Uh, is testing God always wrong? In the way that they did it here, yes. So, when you say, what do you mean by testing God? Well, I, I could be wrong. Yes, yes. Prove me on this. Prove, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Yes, yes. Um, huh? Yeah. The thing about Gideon is I don't think he was right. I don't think I think he was wrong to do what he did, and God was gracious to him. Y'all know Gideon. You know he's talking about Gideon. He threw out a fleece, and God graciously showed him. Okay, this is what I want you to do by not allowing do. And then Gideon did it again. Oh, okay, well now do the opposite. Now do the opposite for me. I think, um, yeah, I'm going to make some of y'all mad, but I honestly think throwing out a fleece and seeing what God is, uh, seeing what God will tell me, you know, like, God, if you, if you want me to go there, make this light turn green. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. I think that's completely wrong. But the idea of, to answer your question, Evan, um, yes, God does say, prove me on this. See if I'm not. But that is in response to a promise that God has made. Here is just an open rebellion of we don't believe that you're with us. We don't believe that you're going to provide for us. We don't believe your word. Uh, so when God makes a promise and says, and you, you test me on it to see if I won't keep my word. Um, I don't think that that in, it, in and of itself is wrong. The, the passage I'm thinking of is in, in is it Malachi, where he says, uh, test me and prove me, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't be able to receive. Yeah. That might be equivocation. I mean, that might be just a little... But regardless... It's wrong here the way that they tested him because what they were doing was doubting 
doubting his word, doubting his provision. They were lashing out against the leader that he has uh, put in place. Remember, Moses didn't lead them to Rephidim or whatever that name of that place was. Moses was God's leader and he was leading the people, but it was a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud that he, Moses said, okay, there they go, so let's go. You know, M Moses wasn't the one who said, let's go to this place. And Moses wasn't the one that provides water, but they were lashing out against him. And, and verse 7 was really, um, really the thing that, that defined the testing for me because it says, he named them these places because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord with us or not? And so they were doubting his presence with them after he had made promises to them and proven by his miraculous works with the water and the manna and all of the things that he was indeed with them. Not to mention the fact that all you have to do is look over there at the pillar of fire and you can see that he's with you. So their, um, their testing of him was judgment, I think. Well, it's not judgment, but rebellion. Yes? That, that little song, but... Lord is mine and I am his. His banner over me is love. Ah, okay. The, he brought me, that, then another verse, he brought me to his banqueting table. His banner over me is love. He is the vine and we are the branches. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. He is, his banner over me is love. And you know, the banner, the Lord is my banner. He, because of his great love for his people, mm -hmm. that says it all. Yeah. Showing his mercy and kindness so Yeah. Yeah. Over and over by granting them these miracles. Absolutely. And, and whether we. The, because the Hebrew here is so hard, I mean, it, there, there's several things, there's several uh, case endings and tenses in Hebrew that can be taken one of two ways, and that's why it's, that's why it's a little difficult to translate. Um, and, and to be honest, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I can't tell you this is the exact translation. Um, but the point remains the same because of the context. We're talking about the victory over enemies. And therefore, the banner, God is our banner. And so whatever enemies attack, whatever spiritual enemies or whatever worldly enemies or whatever, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that if we all join up in an army, we're always going to win. But we're talking about God's purposes and God's people. He is always working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And therefore, we we don't have to we don't have to fear not having the victory in Christ, not having the victory of the Lord, even if it means our death, we are victorious for the Lord fights for us. Okay? All right. The Lord, basically, the Lord's sitting on His throne, and when His people reach out in faith, He answers in faithfulness to His promise. You see the two contrasts? On the, the first one, the people had no faith. People had no faith. Didn't, is God with us or not? Where is He? Give us water. Why did you bring us out here to die? God strikes, not them, but Himself standing on the rock in judgment. The second story, we don't know about, we don't know about all the people, but the people with Joshua and the people up on the hill with Moses, they had faith, trusting that God would provide, and God did miraculously, faithfully giving victory to His people. And once again... You see the gospel. Jesus Christ is our banner, our protector, our victory. Jesus is on the throne. And when we fight our spiritual battles, against not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, we know that we are already victorious. And we may take scars and bumps and bruises and all of that is true. I'm sure it happened to the Israelites who were fighting with Joshua down below. But the victory belongs to us because of our dependence on the Lord and our Lord is always victorious. Questions, comments? Okay, let's pray. Father, we do love you and we thank you that you are our banner. God, we thank you that you are the rock from which our spiritual life, our living water comes. We thank you that you took the judgment upon yourself to provide life for us. God, and we thank you that we can rest in the fact that 
Although we will have to fight in this life as we wander through this world as pilgrims in your name, God, we don't do so with fear or worry or even uncertainty about how the outcome of the battle will be. For we know that you are already victorious. You are sitting upon your throne. And when those attack your throne, you are victorious. When we lift our hands in faith to your throne, touching your throne in prayer, in trusting of who you are, we know that we are victorious. God, help us to see that victory um, with true, spiritual, faithful eyes. Help us to see that victory through the promise that you had made, not the circumstances which we find ourselves in. And God, help us to walk faithfully according to your word. We do thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen.